He was arguably the greatest writer in history. His works have been translated into every living language and even the fictional alien language of Klingon in Star Trek. He's been credited with literally inventing over 1,700 new words and phrases, many of which remain in common usage to this day. Yet, he was an aspiring Catholic tradesman's son during a time of great upheaval, who apparently left school at 13 only to be forced into a murky shotgun marriage at the age of 18 with a much older pregnant woman. Despite these challenges, he somehow managed to pen works that showed an incredible breadth and depth of knowledge of law, medicine, botany, geography, politics, history, religion, and even human psychology that mark him as a true Renaissance man. And yet, we have so few pieces of material evidence about him that we could fit everything we know of his life into literally one paragraph. We can't even be sure that the portraits we instantly recognize are actually his. And yet, there are over a thousand books that have been written about him, almost all of which are based on pure speculation. Some even suggest that the man we assume to be the greatest treasure of the English-speaking world could not possibly be the obscure son of an illiterate glovemaker, but merely a frontman or pseudonym for a restless aristocrat wanting to keep anonymous. Join us as we dive into the life and times of William Shakespeare, take a brief look at some of his works, themes and their significance, and review some of the ongoing controversies that have plagued our understanding of his legacy to this very day. But before we begin, please take a moment to like and subscribe for updates, and if you enjoy our content, please click on the PayPal link in the description section to leave a donation, or sign up as a Patreon supporter to help keep this unfunded educational channel going. Don't forget to share and leave a comment, and as always, thanks for watching. Background Our story begins in Renaissance Italy, not yet the nation we know today, instead made up of dozens of independent principalities and micro-republics. The whole region was gripped by an incredibly intense period of intellectual, literary, scientific and artistic flourishing in European history, which is generally believed to have emerged following the fall of Constantinople to the Turks in 1453. The flood of subsequent refugees through Venetian, Genoese, Hospitaller and Ragusan trading routes during these protracted wars brought with them a wealth of Greek and Roman literature from antiquity, along with texts on medicine, astronomy, mathematics that they imbibe from the Muslims. In the West, most of this knowledge had long been lost, but the great trading and banking families of Europe revived a fascination, indeed a moral boosting of nostalgia, for the superiority of their ancestors of antiquity over their barbarian neighbours. Florence and Venice in particular served as sources of dissemination of this recovered knowledge, which emphasised a humanistic model of civilization drawing from the Greeks the idea that man is the measure of all things. Not surprisingly, the church in Rome and its network of power-broking bishops were highly suspicious of all this fascination with pagan literature, so what they couldn't manipulate into justifying support for themselves, they swiftly suppressed and banned. In my video on the perfect medieval storm, I mentioned how royal houses throughout Europe which had been manipulated by the church to serve its own political agenda, eventually got their own back by supporting dissident intellectuals who would work to erode the church's grip on power and subversively agitate to restore rightful primacy of allegiance to the kings. This subversion of ambitious monarchs, under an increasingly corrupt and scandalous papacy, now accelerated full pace, 
first with the emergent Italian republics and then throughout the northern Protestant breakaway kingdoms. The church couldn't burn everything, of course, and intellectuals of the age quickly adopted the ancient Greek and Roman obsession with mathematics, geometry, and its extension into ciphers, secret codes, and hidden messages. They used this advanced yet esoteric knowledge to communicate with one another through dissemination of sensitive information. Ironically, the early Christians themselves violently persecuted by the Roman Empire, were among the most active users of anagrams, ciphers and hidden symbols, but by the 1500s they were now the oppressors and had entirely forgotten the very art they so masterfully engaged in a thousand years earlier. Prestige by association to ancient Rome now became an obsession in art, architecture and discourse, as the bourgeoisie competed to obtain forbidden or lost material, and they poured vast fortunes into sponsorship of the sensual, the spectacular and the grand that would portray them as inheritors of a bygone Roman legacy. This flow and correspondence across borders came to a jarring halt with the Protestant wars, Great thinkers who had been exchanging controversial ideas and artistic talent across the entire continent now found themselves even more increasingly scrutinized by a paranoid papal inquisition on one side and fanatical Protestant iconoclasts on the other. It's this crackdown on the free exchange of ideas that is believed to be at the heart of the formation of a number of different secret societies, chief among them the Rosicrucians and the Freemasons, whose humanist emphasis on, among other things, alchemy, or what we might today call personal development, was necessarily cloaked in symbolism that was impossible to decipher by non-initiates. In England there were many, but perhaps the three greatest examples of cipher and alchemy-obsessed intellectuals were Sir Francis Bacon, thought by some to be the Grand Master of the Rosicrucians, and John Dee, the Queen's personal conjurer, cryptographic genius, spy and lunatic extraordinaire, and somewhat later Sir Isaac Newton, who actually wrote more books on alchemy than he did on physics. However, the Renaissance itself arrived very late in Britain, about 150 years after it began in Italy. One of the reasons for this is that England was embroiled in the Hundred Years' War with France, and then later the Wars of the Roses for another 32 years. Political stability, which is usually necessary for a flourishing of the arts and sciences, only began in earnest once the Tudors came to power, and like many Renaissance monarchs, they sponsored the arts, so long as it served their political purposes. But in an England which had just seen the overthrow of Catholic rule, then a reversal, and then a reversal back again, the Protestant government of Queen Elizabeth I was paranoid lest the Catholic population was moved to overthrow her rule. There was the very real presence of Catholic agents and missionaries infiltrating the entire countryside, so severe crackdowns were imposed on any activity that could be used in a subversive or potentially seditious manner. This included a restriction on travel of itinerant groups of play actors who had long moved from town to town putting on religious and reenactment plays for the entertainment of ordinary people. But these now ran the risk of their dramas being interpreted as supporting the Pope or a previously Catholic monarch. Their workaround was to only approve companies that had the patronage of trusted nobles, and these would be employed or commissioned to perform authorised work in a more regulated and consequently professional way. Initially, these groups performed their plays in private gardens, schools and homes, but eventually they found their way into entertainment arenas that were typically, and perhaps with echoes of their Roman history, used for much more violent shows such as cockfighting and bear baiting, to the applause and amusement of 
beer-swilling, pie-munching spectators of all classes. It wasn't unusual for a crowd to revel in the gore of bestial savagery before lunch and then afterwards watch a love story, complete with magic, fireworks, historical allegory and tear-jerking sentimentality. Ancient Theatre Most of this new Renaissance drama, now flooding into England, heavily drew from Roman sources that were themselves modelled upon the ancient Greeks. These comedies were referred to as fabulae paliatae, with their scenes usually set in urban public squares, and their stories based on set types of stock characters that usually wore masks and cloaks to indicate their role. It's from these ancient roots that masks have been adopted as symbols of theatre right up to modern times. The typical cast of characters of an ancient play included the adolescens amator, or the lovesick hero, the virgo, the girl next door who is out of his reach, socially, politically or situationally, the meretrix, a prostitute that often forms a love triangle, the senex, an austere or sometimes loony father figure, the servus calidus, a cunning slave, the leno, a calculating pimp or shady businessman, the miles gloriosus, the bragging soldier slash tough guy slash macho competitor, and the parasitus, a slave that exploits his unwitting master. Plots of these plays typically involved middle-class citizens and their slaves. They employed thwarted love plans, parent-child conflicts, and often comedies of mistaken identity but more subtly they are thought to represent exaggerated cultural aspects of an ancient society. Wives and women in these plots generally played only minor roles, with little emphasis on character development or consequence. It was definitely a case of blokey stories written for blokes. In fact, even the actors were strictly men only, with women's roles being played by boys in drag. Renaissance play companies continued this ancient tradition right through to 1560 in Italy, but over a century later in England, well after Shakespeare's time. Think about that next time you imagine the balcony scene from Romeo and Juliet. The best examples, and the ones most influencing the English drama scene, were based on the works of Plautus and Terence. Terence was actually a freed African slave, whose plays were more sophisticated, thoughtful and compelling than that of preceding playwrights. Shakespeare drew strongly both in style and plot design from these two writers, and it's thought that Terence especially stimulated Shakespeare's own obsessive exploration of psychological themes such as irony, dilemma and the use of suspense. Tragedies, on the other hand, often had a historical or mythological theme and basically resulted in an ending with a pile of bodies. There were a number of authors that were considered excellent writers of tragedy, with Seneca among the most celebrated. Seneca himself was the first to employ the five-act structure, which included the exposition, the complication, the climax, the reversal and denouement. Seneca also relied on stock characters and plots, but his stories were typically darker than most, introducing on-stage murder and gore. This was unlike the Greek school from which Roman theatre evolved, who viewed gore as distasteful and Greeks had all such actions occur off-stage. Seneca's plays also reflected the uncertainties of Roman life, placing much less reliance on the beneficent intervention of gods and allowing an element of chance to creep into his stories. He was himself later ordered to commit suicide by a paranoid Nero and Seneca remains one of the world's great stoic exemplars in actually doing so. Literary works by other authors such as Ovid also infused theatre with his metamorphosis themes particularly influencing Shakespeare's own obsession with themes of transformation, appearance, contrast and time. Traditional History 
So now that we've looked a little bit at the political and artistic background of the time, let's move on to explore the life of our protagonist, the man known to us today as William Shakespeare, and the traditional and accepted story of how he came to be the greatest writer in history. William was baptised in the Church of the Holy Trinity in the small Midlands town of Stratford-upon-Avon in Warwickshire, England, on the 26th of April, 1564. There is a romantic quality to settling on this date, as it happens to be the feast day of St George, the patron saint of England, and moreover, it was also recorded as the day Shakespeare died, in 1616, at the age of 52. We know that William was the son of John Shakespeare, or is it Shakespeare, Shapir, or Shakespeare? I mention this because at the time, spelling and pronunciation throughout England was so fluid that in the 70 odd documents where his or William's names are written, no two entries are ever spelled the same way. But we'll come back to that later. Now, John Shakespeare was born a farmer's son in the nearby village of Snitterfield. He married Anne Arden, whose wealthy landowner family were not only Catholics, but were suspected of hiding Jesuit missionaries that kept them perpetually on the government radar. Some speculation, you're going to hear that phrase a lot, just warning you, some speculation has it that John Shakespeare was also a secret Catholic, but his ambition to climb the social ladder means that he would have had to swear his allegiance to the Queen and her Protestant anti-papal government. He surely must have done so, for he managed to get himself elected as town alderman, and then swiftly climbed his way through the ranks to eventually make bailiff, and then mayor of Stratford in 1568. I mention all this because some theories about William have suggested, and you'll hear that phrase a lot too, that he was embroiled in the Catholic network of skullduggery against the crown throughout the next few decades. But as we'll continually see, virtually everything you'll ever read about Shakespeare is based on filling the extremely wide gaps in the record with sometimes intuitive but frequently fanciful speculation. Mark Twain once compared our construction of William Shakespeare the man as like a brontosaurus in a Victorian museum. Only nine bones, but 600 barrels of plaster. Anyway, when John and his wife moved to Stratford, I'm going to shorten it for convenience, so apologies to my Stratford-upon-Avon friends. John somehow either qualified for or acquired a glove-making business, and from there, his rise to civic prominence was indeed rapid, and it appears that he was quite the businessman, soon buying properties and expanding his portfolio into tanning and wool dealing. In fact, he was getting so disproportionately cashed up for a mere glove maker as to raise a number of questions about where the money came from. Research into contemporary archives has subsequently turned up a number of lawsuits and tax records that show Shakespeare Sr was a bit of a town hustler. He was busted selling wool and other goods on the black market, and more seriously, was also reported for illegal money lending, being fined on a number of occasions, till eventually his shady business empire collapsed and he went broke. Mounting debts soon meant that he lost his standing as an alderman, and we hear little of him from the late 1570s on. He and Mary nevertheless went on to have eight kids, with William being the third born, but the first to make it beyond his first year, his two older sisters dying of one or other of the many infectious illnesses, such as the bubonic plague, that saw infant mortality rates spike up to 40% in some places at the time. Now, we actually know nothing at all about William's childhood. There was a public grammar school in town that he may have attended. As the son of a local businessman come politician, it's certainly feasible to speculate. But no enrolment records of the school exist. Nobody in the town ever confirmed that he went there. He himself never mentioned it explicitly 
and there isn't a shred of evidence that can verify his attendance there. There are no classmates that reminisced about their time in school with the great bard, or school teachers who took some of the credit, or to whom he might have later paid homage. Absolutely nothing. It's probably worth reiterating that we have not one letter, journal entry, note or anecdote that William ever wrote about his own life, or that others that knew him might have shared with us. The official narrative is that by the age of about 13, William was forced to abandon his studies due to a lack of money brought on by his father's collapsed business ventures. But the truth of it is that we just don't know. Apocryphal stories suggest that he might have spent the next couple of idle years helping out in his father's glove shop, working for a local butcher, poaching deer on a local estate, or even in some more fanciful versions, accompanying Drake on his world safari, or perhaps more prosaically, teaching school for a prominent Catholic landowner in Lancashire. These and many more imaginative stories permeate the thousand or so books written to try and explain how the obscure son of a parochial and illiterate hustler developed into a literary genius with nothing but a primary school education. All this before apparently returning back to mum and dad's place and knocking up local spinster Anne Hathaway, subsequently being hurriedly forced into a shotgun wedding with her at the tender age of 18 in 1582, where William finally shows up in the record for the first time since his baptism. Anyway, our newlywed teenage stud soon moved his obviously gravid, much older bride into mum and dad's place, where little Susanna was born just six months later in 1583. Now, this marriage would have been the death knell of any future trade career, as it was forbidden for married men to become apprentices. We can only assume that either he sat around working on a future stand-up routine, or otherwise he must have spent the ensuing years helping his father resurrect his own business prospects. And certainly, future evidence of litigation, acquisitions and shady business dealings of his own found in the National Archives suggests that William was indeed a chip off the old block, in fact, almost everything we know about Shakespeare the man is derived solely from petty lawsuits, depositions, negotiations, acquisitions, as well as citations for tax evasion. Regardless of what he was up to, he was likely still living at his parents' home, because the next reference we have for him is the baptism of his twins, Hamnet, yes, Hamnet, and Judith, named after a husband and wife that were family friends and godparents. The Lost Years Now things get a bit murky, as if they weren't already. After the birth of the twins, eight excruciatingly silent years go by before William's name suddenly shows up in London, apparently as a poet as well as actor working for the Lord Chamberlain's men one of many new theatre companies operating on the seedy fringes of the city. We also hear his name publicly mentioned for the first time in 1592 by an ageing rival dramatist of the university type by the name of Robert Green, who took a veiled swipe at someone called Shakespeare in one of his books as being an unqualified upstart that flogged the work of others off as his own. The troubling thing about this sudden appearance out of nowhere is that if William was busy writing, reading and visiting the intellectuals that would have taught him about the many scientific, medical and philosophical ideas he would later incorporate into his plays, neither he nor they journaled it. It's clear from his works that he had a very solid grasp of both High French and Italian, since a number of foreign works he clearly drew from had not yet been translated into English. And yet, 
We have nothing to go on about where or how he might have learned to read and speak these languages sufficiently fluently to draw so proficiently from their stories. His relatively short time at grammar school was spent rote learning Latin and Professor Alan Nelson tells us that grammar schools during Elizabethan times focused almost exclusively on Latin with no training at all in English, arithmetic, geometry, astronomy, music, let alone any other contemporary languages. So, if he did indeed learn to speak them during the lost eight years, as well as draw social, cultural and geographical elements of these countries, neither he nor anyone else suggested how, where or by whose aid it happened. Unless, of course, other writers contributed to these plays and used him solely as a frontman or broker. So, the conventional story now goes that a travelling theatre group must have turned up in Stratford one day for a play sometime soon after Shakespeare's twins were born, and that they were one man short due to the stabbing of one of their actors in a recent drunken pub brawl. Supposedly, Shakespeare was recruited as a stand-in actor to fill the vacancy, and then he must have continued on with the troupe throughout England, amassing his multi-PhD level education from the equivalent of a bunch of drunken Hollywood celebrities, all the while taking the pulse of seismic political events of the time, such as the invasion of the Spanish Armada. This troupe eventually dispersed, but some of the lead actors, including Shakespeare, must have been offered a job in the permanent venue of the outer suburbs of London. If this is true, we can only stand in even greater roar of his genius, yet there is also a nagging sense of disappointment in the abandonment of his wife and kids to run away with the proverbial circus. Finding himself in London, it would seem that Shakespeare had quickly developed a name for himself in the years before Green first took a swipe at him. When he published the long narrative poems, Venus and Adonis, and The Rape of Lucrece, which those of you who have watched my video and Brutus will be very familiar with. These poems he curiously dedicated to the young Earl of Southampton, Henry Risley. Most scholars would agree that Shakespeare viewed himself primarily as a poet, and these early works suggest so, but his failure to gain patronage from the Earl meant that he had to find other means to make a living. So, working as an actor, perhaps assisting other playwrights, and in a sense studying under them, is the most commonly accepted avenue of his transformation from poetry to playwriting. Shakespeare would now go on to be credited for two plays a year for the next 20 years. It's been estimated that 25 of these plays were written during the reign of Queen Elizabeth till she died in 1603, and the rest after James I ascended the throne. It would seem then that his darkest psychological works were written after Elizabeth's death. Early on in London, Shakespeare would have no doubt come across other already famous contemporary playwrights, particularly Thomas Kidd and Christopher Marlowe, who were known to be sharing lodgings with one another nearby. Marlowe, the son of a shoemaker, who was the same age as Shakespeare, was already a master of his craft and himself showed early talent, excelling in Latin and earning a scholarship to Cambridge, a bachelor's degree and then a master's in arts. He would become quite a controversial and mysterious figure, with strong speculation that he was a government agent, engaging in espionage in France. Nevertheless, it seems he still had the time to pen substantially longer, more sophisticated and serious plays than anyone else at the time, being described as the foremost Elizabethan dramatist of the age, exploring themes of ruthless excessive ambition and their tragic consequences, such as in the play Dr. Faustus. Marlowe is credited with pioneering the use of blank verse, something Shakespeare ultimately perfected, 
And there are many who believe that Marlowe was the real brains behind Shakespeare's writing. The Spanish tragedy written by Thomas Kidd was also very popular at the time and set new benchmarks in theatre. It catered to the late Elizabethan taste for violence informed by revenge, a model that became full-blown in the Jacobean theatre, subsequently to be known as the genre of revenge tragedy. You killed my father. Big mistake. It's clear that this also rubbed off strongly on Shakespeare. Indeed, Shakespeare may have been an understudy, scribe or ghostwriter of sorts to them, at a time when there were literally dozens of playhouses churning out dozens of new plays every month to a demographically broad audience hungry for diversion and entertainment at a time when London was one of the most populous and cosmopolitan cities in Europe, yet at the same time subject to the ever-present fear of both the plague and a draconian police state. Of these two, the plague seems to have been particularly noteworthy, as several outbreaks occurred, most notably in 1593, 1603, 06, 08 and 1610, which, in echoes of today, saw numerous lockdowns, with theatres closed sometimes for over a year at a time, and government subsidies paid to companies to help keep their businesses afloat. Many people left London, and Shakespeare may have been among them, or alternatively used his time in lockdown to focus on writing. The disruption to performances in London forced the company to go on the road, and while on tour, records inform us that his son Hamnet died in 1596, at the age of 11, of unknown causes. We can't say whether William made it to the funeral, and again, we have no correspondence of any kind that reveal where he was or how he felt. His closest friends and associates were also excruciatingly silent. Some have suggested that the introspective and melancholic tone of the play Hamlet was both a play on the name and based on the grief over his loss. By 1597, Shakespeare certainly seems to have made a greater effort to spend more time at home, purchasing one of the largest houses in Stratford where he moved his remaining family. This huge purchase infers that by 1597 he was already considerably wealthy. While the theatre takings for the company were certainly sizable for the time, his own cut of the profit remains unknown, and he may have actually made most of his fortune from the side hustles and business dealings he learned from his father. By 1599, disputes with the landlord of their London venue prompted the shareholders of the company to build a new theatre across the Thames on the South Bank, which came to be known as the Globe. While the theatre was very popular, repeated outbreaks of the plague meant that there were often long periods of closure. Some estimates indicate lockdowns of 60 months in total between 1603 and 1610. Queen Elizabeth eventually passed away in March of 1603. When King James ascended to the throne, he quickly took on personal patronage of the theatre company, which now changed its name from the Lord Chamberlain's Men to the King's Men, performing regular and numerous plays in his presence. Again, neither the new king nor the court ever had anything to say about this singularly brilliant commoner and his freakishly imaginative command of both linguistics and human psychology. By 1609, the King's Men had established themselves at the indoor venue of Blackfriars, which was smaller and more intimate than the Globe, where performances could be held over the winter months. They now also regularly introduced the work of other cutting-edge playwrights, including Ben Jonson, and catered to a more affluent and sophisticated audience. Even here, 
We have no records, journals or letters of anyone in that more genteel audience that might have come to know Shakespeare on a personal or intellectual level or cared to comment on the profoundly touching tragedies that were being presented to them. Some general notes on the plays. There are many ways to approach Shakespeare's plays. We can stand in awe at his genius as a poet, his supreme command of the English language, and the unequalled power and subtlety of his verse. We can admire his skill as a dramatist, his ability to energize a scene and to create complex characters and probe their psychological depths. And we can also explore the many insights into the nature of the human condition that Shakespeare's plays embody. His reflections on such universal human concerns as love, marriage, parenthood, friendship, responsibility, the family, aging, and even death. Most scholars would agree that Shakespeare borrowed heavily from many other writers, but even when using other people's material, he would rework it in such a way as to be perennially elegant, succinct, and powerful. He could say in three words what took others an entire paragraph, and yet, ironically, when he couldn't find the words, he just made them up, with some estimating that he literally invented a tenth of the words in the English language, many of which have remained in popular use to this very day. But perhaps more profoundly, Shakespeare took the styles and methods of all his predecessors and expanded on them by smashing traditional stock plots and stock figures and by drawing us in and making each of us play the part of each of the protagonists. And that's a further point. A villain was no longer simply a villain. They had complex characters, conflicting motivations and backstories of their own. Often, a good guy was forced to go bad or to make Hobson's or false choices. Shakespeare was always interested in the subjective human experience, creating morally ambiguous characters. These are ideas highly influenced by Renaissance humanism. Shakespeare, perhaps more than anyone else at the time, used his plays to explore wider philosophical themes. The four most prominent among them are appearance and reality, change, order and disorder, and conflict resolution. Henry IV is an example of a history play that is essentially a story about relationships, or more precisely, the parable of the prodigal son. It touches on the masculine initiatory tradition of juvenile rejection and later reconciliation of the father. Topics I discuss on my other channel, on Joseph Campbell's hero's journey and the grim brother fairy tale of Iron John. See the links in the description section or the liked videos on this channel. The contrasting notions of adult responsibility versus self-indulgence are depicted in this play and are significant so far as they have both personal as well as societal consequences. To that end, Henry's usurpation of his own predecessor, Richard II, is not just a clever bit of pro-Tudor propaganda, but also a lesson in the catastrophic outcomes of disrupting the established order. And yet, the beauty of these plays is that ten different people will see ten different lessons, and that's something that can be said about much of Shakespeare's other work. Shakespeare also has a lot to say about politics, perhaps more than is at first obvious, and certainly more than you would expect from a commoner. In Coriolanus, written about seven or eight years after Julius Caesar, but actually set way before, during the time of the early Roman Republic, Shakespeare shows us what it's like to live in a deeply political regime. Professor Paul Cantor, an eminent scholar of the political aspect of Shakespeare's writing, tells us, it's essentially a lesson in moderation. We have a uniquely powerful, ambitious and successful individual who oversteps the boundaries of acceptable personal status, and we have a common populace 
who come to realize that they have the ability to exercise real political power and take matters into their own hands. At a time of extreme political sensitivity in England, Shakespeare suggests that it is possible for ordinary people to not only have a voice, but to participate in the political process. By couching his writing in the form of a historical play, he manages to avoid the persecution that might have befallen him were he to write directly about such subjects. Some have suggested that the emphasis on Rome and Venice in a number of his plays is an exploration of the idea of republicanism and how England might draw some value from them as a constitutional monarchy engaging in widespread maritime trade. We see this in one of the central themes that permeate Shakespeare's work, in the tenuous relationship between a single powerful individual and the community he serves and rules. He also explores throughout his histories and tragedies the theme of tyranny, but more precisely, illegitimate power as compared to legitimate power. In his Roman plays, we also witness a subtle but profound change in perspective. In Coriolanus, strength, victory and success are viewed as virtuous. But, chronologically speaking, through Julius Caesar and certainly by the end of Antony and Cleopatra, death and failure seem to take on an almost desirable nobility in contrast to victory. Professor Cantor goes on to tell us that the examination of suicide as a legitimate form of death is dealt with quite profoundly in his Roman pagan era plays in contrast to Shakespeare's Christian ones, where Hamlet famously agonizes over the implications in terms of both sin and the afterlife of taking his own life. Few writers of the period have ever dared to entertain the philosophical nature of suicide in their works, but Shakespeare handles the subject deftly, subtly and tenderly throughout his theatrical plays. Writers of the ancient world were largely divided between those who specialized in comedies, where there was always a happy ending, and tragedies, where there was almost always a pile of bodies. Plato once famously said that the greatest writer in the world would be the one who could master both of these genres. In the ancient world, arguably no one managed to bridge that gap. Some of Shakespeare's contemporaries tried, with modest success, but none of them achieved anything even close to the mastery Shakespeare had over both of these spheres, and in that sense, he proved Plato right. He was so good at it that he could even successfully mix elements of humour into a tragedy, and vice versa, in a way that is virtually impossible to writers today, without making their novel or film look ridiculous or farcical. Imagine a comic sidekick in Schindler's List, Gandhi, or in Saving Private Ryan. Shakespeare was the kind of writer who could pull it off and still leave you profoundly affected by the story. Professor Cantor also believes that Shakespeare's view of the Renaissance was not a particularly positive one. He believed that Shakespeare was essentially interested in the tragedy of competing ethics that is to say, those of the Christian era, as contrasted to that of antiquity. Shakespeare's view on the definition of tragedy differed astronomically from that of preceding writers in that he didn't simply view tragedy as a conflict between good and evil, but often between two alternatives of good. In his case, the ethics of antiquity competing with the ethics of the Christian era, both of which he viewed as noble but opposed. Most obviously we see the conflict within Hamlet. Killing Claudius, for example, was no longer a simple matter of dispensing material justice. If, in doing so, Claudius ended up going to heaven as a victim, then the whole thing was pointless. The heroes of antiquity never had to deal with what happened to the soul of their antagonists, and in that sense, their choices and dilemmas were simple 
But in the Christian world, a hero's choices now involve this added layer of complexity, and therein lay the anxieties that gripped not only Hamlet, but any Christian who was placed in such a dilemma. Similarly vexatious was the view on suicide of the ancients in contrast to the severe pronouncements of the church against it. It was no longer an honourable way to exit, but a sure ticket to hell. These ideas may seem quaint to us nowadays, but to Shakespeare they presented an enormous source of moral contradiction that needed to be explored. In his shifting of the goalposts of traditional notions of good and evil, we see the precursor of a whole line of philosophical inquiry that would influence later thinkers such as Hegel, Nietzsche and Kierkegaard among others. So Hamlet then is effectively the story of a true Renaissance man thrust into the ancient world of a Norse saga. While the original source story would simply have Hamlet exacting revenge, the end, Shakespeare has him grapple with being a modern man living in a Christian, non-Viking Europe. In a sense, Hamlet was presented as straddling those two opposing worlds and being forced to choose one of them. Remember, these plays were written at a time when ancient Roman and Greek texts and traditions were being revived all through Europe. So, all throughout his tragedies, Shakespeare explored the contradictions and tensions that needed to be faced by a Christian continent seeking to reconnect with their pagan ancestors in a meaningful way. Macbeth and Othello, on the other hand, are described as being the inverse of Hamlet, being, psychologically at least, men of antiquity in their ethics, but thrust into a modern Christian world and struggling to come to terms with it, which ultimately leads to the same kind of outcome as in Hamlet. Macbeth is considered a Homeric warrior who kills people and expects them to stay dead, but the continuous presence of ghosts throughout the play highlights the conflicts of conscience within a pagan ancient Scotland slowly transforming into a Christian civilization. Othello similarly finds himself cast as a figure of antiquity, basically a hired Turk expected to do Venice's dirty work, but excluded from their civilization despite his own Christianity, because he is supposedly only a two-dimensional soldier type who can't grasp the sophistication of Europeans or their women. It's perhaps not insignificant that this play was written during the time that members of Elizabeth's Privy Council were seriously petitioning the Queen to expel all the blacks, or blackamoors as they were called, from England and deport them to Spain. While their scheme never got off the ground, it at least suggests an air of xenophobia within the otherwise cosmopolitan city of London that must have given Shakespeare significant food for thought. On the subject of Venice, Shakespeare seems to have taken a particular interest in the city, which at the time was the most successful contemporary trading nation in Europe. It had a lucrative maritime trade empire, which represented a model that England might follow. But more subtly, it also managed to incorporate elements into its community that solved problems that were inherently challenging to Christians money lending being forbidden, they introduced Jews to manage finance, for example. And it is evident through his plays that in such a multi-ethnic, prosperous trading nation, the power of the church was also waning. In a Protestant England, paranoid about Catholic uprisings, this would have been an interesting theme for him to explore, particularly in The Merchant of Venice, but with the added layer of a revived Republican political system and how it flourished as a mercantile republic. Shifting a little on this theme of power, Titus Andronicus is considered by some to be Shakespeare's darkest tragedy and relates a gruesome tale of a Roman king who eventually descends into madness, leaving a trail of slaughter and destruction in his wake. He even has the children of his enemies 
baked into a pie and fed to them unbeknownst. Gruesome as it is, the play feeds into the lust for violent entertainment during these times, but it also shows a fusion of both tragedy and comedy, which was completely unheard of at the time and plays on his continuing exploration of the juxtaposition of opposites, a genre that we now call black comedy. Contrast as a theme is also explored in the play Measure for Measure, particularly through the examination of justice. And so we see everything being balanced against something else. Extending this theme of justice, Shakespeare also explores the position of women in society and their exploitation, something that few writers were willing to legitimize at the time. He also explores the corruptive nature of power and hypocrisy, and by extension, the nature of civil authority, where strong leadership needs to be balanced with compassion and common sense. As usual in Shakespeare, the play is deeply concerned with the way things seem to be versus how they really are. Later Years As the years rolled by, Shakespeare eventually became a grandfather. His oldest daughter, Susanna, had married a prominent local doctor, John Hall, in 1607, and they had their first and only child, Elizabeth, in 1608. Shakespeare, now in his late 40s, appears to have increased collaboration with younger writers and himself pulled back from acting, perhaps to spend more time at home, moving back to Stratford in about 1612. When he became the grandfather of a little girl, some have suggested that he became more interested in the redeeming effect that the younger generation has on the older. And we see that in plays like The Tempest, The Winter's Tale and Pericles, stories populated by girls who bring about the redemption of the old, worn-out generation, still pursuing their greedy ambitions. And yet, curiously, Shakespeare himself made no provision for the education of either his own daughters, who remained illiterate, or for his granddaughter Elizabeth. A peculiar contradiction indeed for a writer who regularly portrayed strong and intelligent women, as well as fathers who loved them dearly and took great pains to have them educated. We know he still travelled occasionally and spent some weeks in London with his son-in-law, and here again we find another source of frustration. Dr. Hall was a prominent and respected medical practitioner who kept substantial records and a diary. He corresponded widely with his prominent patients and his notes included entries about the concerns of local citizens. He once mentioned a prominent local Warwickshire poet called Michael Drayton and praised his work. Yet Dr. Hall never once mentioned his own father-in-law's occupation, discussed his work or the themes that so profoundly infused his plays in any of his correspondence. Within the next couple of years, Shakespeare went on to die supposedly of a fever on his birthday in 1616. Fortunately, he left a will for which Susanna and Dr. Hall were executors, but as was so often the case with him, it leaves us with far more questions than answers. For example, there are three signatures on the document so poorly written as to be barely legible and completely at odds with what one might expect from an esteemed and professional writer. There are, of course, suggestions that he must have been ill during these later years, possibly even with syphilis, which would have caused neurological degeneration and a shaky hand. Yet, the other signatures we have of his, from much earlier periods, are just as poor, and this has raised much debate among scholars. The will is also suspect for its interlineations, or subsequent additions which would have required him to sign or at least initial the additions to authorize them. Moreover, he inventoried such peculiar items as a silver bowl and a sword, but not one word about his writing equipment, books, 
manuscripts, shares, royalties or other interests in the theatre, which has led some scholars to seriously doubt that he was even literate, let alone the writer of some of the most famous stories in the world. Intriguingly, when he died, there was no public funeral or outpouring of grief, no commemoration, no articles, letters or notes or journal entries of prominent citizens, friends or contemporaries honouring the great man. It wasn't until seven years after his death that the first obscure comments were made in the now famous first folio of plays commemorating his contribution to literature. The statue in the church where he is buried, along with the suspiciously tiny tombstone, and the ambiguous and cryptic inscriptions that were added later, only added to the growing body of conspiracy theories surrounding his true identity. Nor do we hear anything, ever, from his wife Anne Hathaway, who died seven years after her husband and was scarcely mentioned in his will, let alone in other contexts, such as on her own tombstone, such as being the wife of a great writer. Which brings me to the last part of this story. The Anti-Stratfordians I think I've made it pretty obvious that there is, in the words of eminent British historian Michael Woods, a man-sized hole in the biography of William Shakespeare. Of all the written contemporary evidence we have, almost all of it points solely to his considerable interest in acquiring money, rather than the pursuit of literary goals. There are so many questions that beg answers that it has spawned a proverbial Mexican standoff between entrenched academics on the one hand and skeptics over the authorship question on the other. The gaping mysteries surrounding Shakespeare's personal life have been shrugged off by the establishment as not unusual for the time, and there has been an almost dogmatic refusal by them to concede the many inconsistencies that plague the accepted theory of an uneducated glovemaker's son spontaneously becoming the quintessential and preeminent Renaissance man of England. On the other hand, every man and his dog has had a go at filling in the blanks, such that there are entire movements dedicated to debunking what they see as a broker come frontman misrepresented as the actual author. No less than 70 candidates have been proposed as the real Sheikh-Spear, and the basic idea is that the aristocrat responsible intended to remain anonymous for a wide range of possibly dangerous reasons. These theorists generally refer to themselves as anti-Stratfordians, and they contend that the use of both pseudonyms and publication brokers was very common during Elizabethan times, in particular when dealing with sensitive subjects such as dynastic legitimacy, authoritarian government and the abuse of power. Not to mention the subversive new philosophy of humanism. They point to the numerous examples of jailed writers, with both Christopher Marlowe and Thomas Kidd being locked up and tortured for their alleged heresy, atheism, sedition and even homosexuality. Anti-Stratfordians believe that only an aristocrat would have had the education, pedigree, court experience and network of acquaintances necessary to write so intuitively and elegantly on the broad sweep of issues that Shakespeare did. They point out that while Marlowe and later on Ben Jonson were themselves not aristocrats, they were at least highly educated with university scholarships and government recognition. There is certainly much more documentary evidence of their personal and professional lives than there is for Shakespeare. In fact, a study of all the documentary evidence available on the most prominent writers of the day shows Shakespeare as singularly silent for the amount of evidence he has to show for himself, something you might expect for a pen name or alias. Now, it's beyond the scope of this video 
to go into all of the theories in any kind of substantial detail. So I'll just touch upon two of the top contenders and I'll link to a couple of videos in the description section that you might find of interest in case you wanted to pursue the subject further. I'll start with the earlier of the two, Sir Francis Bacon. You recall early on I mentioned that the Renaissance was a time of substantial political intrigue, suppression and persecution of non-conformist ideas, particularly pre-Christian, republican or humanist ones. I mentioned that this led to the emergence of underground networks of societies of intellectuals who mastered the art of secret codes, hidden within art and ciphers, to disseminate this knowledge under the nose of authorities while avoiding personal scandal or execution. The foremost cryptographers of England at the time were John Dee and Sir Francis Bacon, both of whose genius, and in Dee's case probable insanity, have been well established, along with a substantial collection of their works on cryptographic keys they used in the spy game. Bacon was a highly esteemed polymath, prolific writer and respected philosopher who spent much time at the royal court and was intimately aware of the workings, culture and character of the aristocracy, being Solicitor General of the Crown as well as Lord Chancellor under James I. I mentioned earlier that Bacon has been identified as heavily involved in the humanist movement and in particular the Rosicrucians. Popular author Peter Amundsen has identified a number of compelling Rosicrucian cryptic ciphers within the text of the first folio of Shakespeare, which he shows directly points to Bacon as the man behind the mask of Shakespeare. The second group of anti-Stratfordians worth mentioning is currently the largest and most active, being known as the Oxfordian movement. I'll post a link to their website and some of their videos in the description section. They take their name from the 17th Earl of Oxford, Edward de Vere, and they make the claim that of all the possible candidates, the life and person of de Vere most closely resembles the kind of individual that the writer of Shakespeare's plays might have been. They list a number of characteristics which form a compelling argument. Both the Earl and his father before him were also well-known patrons of the arts and had dedicated troops of acting companies that performed both at their home and in the Blackfriars Theatre in which Shakespeare himself later performed. While it's certainly feasible that he might have written plays for his own troupe, the sensitive nature of the subjects of Shakespeare suggests that it might have been wiser to publish them under a different name. Oxford himself was both a notable poet and gifted writer of comedies with stylistic similarities to Shakespeare's own work. All scholars agree that Shakespeare was hugely influenced by the Roman author Ovid. Oxford was the nephew of Arthur Golding, the translator into English of Ovid's Latin works as well as many others, and we know that Oxford at the time lived with Golding while he was doing his research. Oxford's other uncle, the Earl of Surrey, was the inventor of the Shakespearean sonnet form, so he would have made the perfect tutor to his nephew in his study of this art. Oxford's personal Bible still exists and has a remarkable number of underlined passages that correspond very highly to biblical passages used in the Shakespeare plays. Many of the themes and names of Shakespeare's plays have interesting corollaries to Oxford's own life, from the infidelity surrounding his wife, moneylenders in the Merchant of Venice, who happened to have the same names as Oxford's own personal moneylenders, young men falling out at tennis in Hamlet, something that actually happened to Oxford and was well known in court, the capture of Hamlet by pirates and being left naked on a beach was something that actually happened to Oxford while crossing the channel. <laughs> 
A number of cryptographs within both the folio and the Shakespeare monument seem to allude to De Vere as the real Shakespeare, as well as to his real burial site, which is lost to us, but suggested to be Westminster Cathedral. We know that Oxford was lame due to an old riding injury. He was unwell, aging and in some kind of relationship with the Earl of Southampton, which seems to be referred to in the sonnets. The Sonnet Problem I mentioned earlier that Shakespeare is often considered primarily to be a poet, and that his two early poems, Venus and Adonis and The Rape of Lucrece, were probably attempts at securing a patronage from the Earl of Southampton. It was also common practice by many writers to practice their skills by writing sonnets, of which Shakespeare wrote 154, a form which Oxford's uncle pioneered. It may be that Oxford wrote these poems to his future son-in-law, Henry Risley, but the truth is we will never know. In any case, the sonnets seem to tell us, in summary, that there is a lame old poet who, over the course of the first 17 sonnets, is trying to encourage a handsome and noble young man to procreate. This younger noble man appears to be having some kind of affair with the old poet's mistress. A huge scandal has now blown up, and both the old poet and the young nobleman are mixed up in it. Now this has been implied to be a homosexual scandal, or otherwise an economic, or perhaps other kind of reputational ruin. And we certainly know that Oxford ran into substantial economic disaster in his later years. The old poet seems to be asking the younger man to impregnate the old poet's mistress, and he laments that he will be destined to be forgotten. There have been so many interpretations of the sonnets as to make them quite difficult to understand. We know that the sonnets were written at a time that both Oxford and his father-in-law were actively trying to arrange a marriage of Oxford's daughter to the Earl of Southampton, Henry Risley. Oxford was by now late middle-aged, unwell, and as a senior noble would have felt no compunction admonishing a younger and lower ranked noble to take his advice. Shakespeare on the other hand, being a simple commoner, would never have dared to proposition an aristocrat under any circumstances, even if he was his lover, maybe especially so. Shakespeare was also much younger than Oxford and probably in his twenties. So the idea of his being a weary and lame older man is at odds with the chronology of his lifetime. One of the biggest obstacles to the Oxfordian theory of authorship is the fact that Oxford died in 1604, before Shakespeare had written his greatest works, and that references to Britain rather than England now appear after this time, which negates the possibility of an earlier completion. Oxford's supporters contend that the works were largely completed before his death and that they were released sequentially on purpose, under the guidance and supervision of Ben Jonson, who continued to use William Shakespeare as a broker, and that it was common practice for works to be edited, sometimes substantially so, by publishers or other collaborators who thought they could improve upon it or make adjustments to fit the situation. Certainly, we don't have any originally handwritten manuscripts that would verify it one way or the other. Oxfordians further note that when Queen Elizabeth died, no dedicatory poem or memorial was written by Shakespeare, nor a relevant celebration of James I's accession to the throne was made by him, which was almost unanimously marked in some way or other by every other writer in England. To them, this can only mean that the real author of Shakespeare must have already been dead. So what is then the real genius of Shakespeare, and what sets him apart from all the writers of the age, and even thereafter? His great genius, to me, besides the artful use of language, was to observe people as they really are, 
and yet not be judgmental about them. Kenneth Branagh once said that it was impossible to pin him down about what he thinks. Finding the man, trying to find out what his opinions were about almost anything, is very difficult. But along the way, you nevertheless find out a lot about who you are. Arguably, what makes Shakespeare's work so enduring is that he doesn't provide easy answers. He doesn't tell us what to think. He teaches us how to think. His characters and the situations they find themselves in are complex. Complex enough to earn our sympathy and empathy. And that's something we could all use a bit more of right now. <laughs>